I always like to start with the roots, so I was wondering how was Pupak as a child, how was her journey to becoming a woman, and if there was some something really important on how your life has happened then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I grew up in a big town in northern Iran, near the Caspian Sea. Um, so the city I grew up in is called Rasht. And uh, it's a bit of a mystery for the Westerners or people who don't know Iran because um, actually Rasht is known as the city of rain. Mm. We have more than 200 days of rain. <laughs> it's 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 very very wet so whenever it rains and I feel really the air full of moisture I feel at home <laughs> mm. and yeah people think Iran is arid and it's desert and it's you know no moisture um, but but yeah this is we have a unique climate there and we do have this um, city of rain and I grew up there I had a beautiful childhood um, so my mother is from Japan, my dad's from Iran, so our household was slightly different because of my mother input and yeah, it had cultural influences, so I grew up with Japanese food and Japanese stories and folk tales and you know, my family from Japan always sent us food and gifts and so it was a, a yeah, it was a beautiful, I think, combination. My mother is a painter. Uh, my father is writer, poet, so I think I grew up in a very loving and uh, very artistic type of family and grew up going to painting classes, maybe that's why I became a visual artist, I think it's the influence of my mother and uh, yeah, poetry, so then I actually later in life I, I went to school of storytelling and uh, you know I had done performances on poetry and stories and so I think that maybe the influence I had from my father's side and um, yeah so I grew up there till I was 16 and then there was the Iran-Iraq war that happened when I was 12 so the revolution in Iran in 1979 happened when I was 11 yeah, and so these were these were some of the major influences. Um, seeing the upheaval, you know, the revolution was a big, huge change. I mean, this this is generational thing. So people of my generation remember, and um, you know, then we went through the war. So I left in eighty four for Japan, um, and so that's when I was sixteen, and that's in a sense became my life journey. That's then. Um, you know, I ended up here in Fintorn <laughs> somehow many years later. But yeah, my life journey took me from Jap from Iran then because of my f mother's family, I had the opportunity to migrate. Yeah, so it was difficult because, you know, when you lose your home, I you know, you lose all your relations. Um, you kind of, you know, we felt we pushed out and so I kind of really... I sympathize and identify with people who migrate or immigrants, you know, who are forced to leave their land, their home. Um, so that's also one chapter of my earlier childhood. Um, yeah, then I had to, yeah, adjust to life in Japan and <clears throat> learn a new language, a new way of being, which is great. But yeah, you, you know, you kind of shed the skin and and grow and I feel like if you have that opportunity to learn to what it means to shed skin um, it stands you in good stead in life because you have to change always right and you learn how to do this <laughs> constantly <laughs> so I feel like I've had many opportunities to shed skin <laughs> many times I think yeah, in my life so far, I've had four major migrations from Iran to Japan and then to other parts of the world. Yeah. 
So you ask about decolonizing, decoloni process of decolonization, and maybe I can talk about it because I've been through this search, having lived through the war myself and experienced a deeper wounding in this process of seeking of what is peace, you know, what is what is true healing. Um, and yeah, I know for me it's a it's a process, and what I had to do to be at peace was to really have the courage to release, you know, to let go of my traumas, and also to go forward and meet the cause of my wounding. Okay, so I feel it's really important because no matter how spiritual and how giving and how elevated and how whatever brilliant we want to be, I feel is not possible until you go towards that which that has, you cannot stand, you cannot tolerate. There's something that you cannot, you know, because of whatever happened, you like, you may see some people or, you know, as non-human. And it's really important to meet them. And that means, I feel that needs courage, that's loving action. <laughs> And you have to go beyond what is of value to you, you know, you hang on to the world you have constructed. But for me to do that, I had to let go of everything. Let go of everything that I've constructed so that I meet the opponent or the whoever freshly as someone worthy of being a human. Because we are all human, right? And I feel that was my journey. And you're talking about decolonizing. I feel this encounter is very important. You know, is releasing, is really letting go of everything we've constructed. And when that happens, the world presents itself to you within a new way. You know, you find <clears throat> a new something happens, emerges, that's fresh, and it's beautiful again, and you're different. And I feel, for me, that's the process of decolonizing. It's a real organic process. Um, and, and you, yeah, you have to allow yourself to go there. It's a bit of a death process. And uh, I like to hear uh, about how that was and how that made you have an idea that then would change your life completely. Right, yeah. So I left Iran in 1984, when I think I was 16 then, and then, yeah, I had my life in Japan. Um, so when I went back to Iran was the year 2000. It was just the Christmas Eve I crossed the border on foot. Um, and yeah, uh, it was a great shock for me um, when I when I went back because on one hand I was going home, you know I was going <clears throat> to see my grandmother who I love, she raised me and my friends, but on the other hand I was going into a land and I was treated as a stranger. I was treated very badly. Um, so it was a mixture of both, you know, it was a mixture of deep love and going back and um, and the shock of seeing how Iran had changed. And I think, yeah, it was these years of war and whatever happened, almost I didn't recognize. Um, so my impressions of of Iran is a country of people of uh, kindness and and profound literature and um, richness, you know, cultural just abundance and richness. And what I saw experience was the opposite: was poverty, you know, in so many levels, just poor, and, you know, in so many levels. So. I was not ready for it. So yeah, so when I left Iran after that visit, I was there for two months. Um, 
and I was living in England at the time, and this is in the year 2000-2001. Yeah, I kind of fell into a state of depression after that, after that visit, feeling, wow, what happened? I really felt the despair, you know, the despair of the land. I mean, what shocked me was seeing the cows there being really skinny and the dogs, you know, really hungry and people. Wow. Um, and why have we destroyed the land? Because we've forgotten, we've ignored ourselves. And, you know, they're all connected. You know, the, de the process of decolonizing is a and rewilding. They go together. And, you know, what is rewilding? Um, it's, it's, it's to return back to our natural state, you know. Um, and is to know, is to access our deeper power and to have an intention to give back because we've been takers, right? We've been, you know, now we are such a, living in such a consumer culture but even before, as agrarian people, we've been trying to dominate the land we've, you know, we plow the land and destroy the soil and, but fortunately, I mean, now we have teachers who have worked with the soil and have, you know, really showed us how to have a relationship with the soil in a way that's not destructive, you know, not, you know, it, it builds up life force. So it's really about paying attention to the differences there and similarly to our own selves. We tend to, you know, um, if we live habitually, if we live by what we've been ta taught and told, then yeah, we could very well, dis you know, really have a very bad relationship with our bodies, you know, our minds it can be very oppressive. Um, so it needs, it needs a space to pause. It needs a space to stop and say, and throw everything into the fire, really. <laughs> so that that's the connection to the fire ritual. I think I needed to to first experience the pain. Um, the pain of people and the land and then to really sink into this state of depression and I was fortunate so at the time I was I had a little hut in a place called Emerson College in um, Sussex in England and and it was there in my little hut that kind of magic happened and when I was telling the stories about the land and what I felt, and someone visited me and said, well, you know, if all these things you're telling me is true, then what you need to do is to go and plant trees. And uh, trees will bring life force, will, you know, so in this language they talk about etheric forces. And, uh, you know, saying that it will reinforce and, you know, invigorate the etheric forces, um, well, never mind that, but, you know, trees help the land regenerate, really. Um, and also it's a social movement, you know, because you need people, you need color, you need, you know, you need, it becomes a movement to heal, you know, and when you heal the land, you heal yourself. So yeah, that became kind of a dream for me because just the thought of going and tra planting trees and regenerating and helping the land and people to recover, the thought of it was enough to help me get out of depression and become active. And that's how, you know, I found actually myself in a strange way back in Finhorn now because um, I found my well, present husband, um, Alan, who's worked with trees and, you know, he found the trees for life. I asked him to come and visit Iran um, and help me start a project. So he did. It took many years. <laughs> it took many years for me to get it all together and do the fundraising and, you know, get enough money to take him there. But it happened and he did come. Um, and uh, yeah, and that was, I think, the first movement after I declared that I would do this, then, you know, this action followed. And now, many years later, 20, almost two years later, 21 years, um, you know, there's, we have a charity called Trees for Hope, 
and Alan is the chairperson of the charity and um, you know he's helping as much as he can in this capacity of the chairperson and bringing his life experience and his insights and the other board members so I feel yeah and there's a potential there's a potential for um, activating people on the ground because I think is the people who live on the land who would really need to look after the land and have this relationship in a beneficial way so that their presence would help the land heal so we need healing of the self and the land and that's what um, um, I'm creating educational sort of opportunities um, these are the sort of plans now and I'm working with the board of uh, Trees for Hope and I'm really really delighted to have a great board you know the people who are on the board are people I really love and admire so I feel at the moment in a very uh, blessed situation to work with a board that understands and supports the vision and they're really excited by it and not just that I have lots of colleagues and and allies you know tree um, Gaia education Jen has been uh, great allies in this path and um, yeah I think um, this vision is attracting um, friends so I feel because of it because yeah I you know it's funny you take one little step and then things open and change and um, the world changes so yeah I feel because because I said yes and I did something then yeah my own life changed and I can now live in Finhorn and have the opportunity to do more work and even though right now the reality is yeah we have one project so um, the way at the moment we're working is I uh, invite people to come to a training people who want to do something for the environment who love their where they belong they, where they grew up and where they know the land really well and um, and yeah and they come and design their work so I offer the design studios and um, they go back and then I keep supporting them when I the charity that's the mission of the charity but at the moment I'm the only employee so um, yeah that's how it's working at the moment it is beautiful because you somehow mentioned how this seed was planted on you and now you're helping to plant these seeds in other people's projects through, through Trees for Hope and uh, also how you mentioned <laughs>